we're talking about relationships. And we've talked about a bunch of different types of relationships and different relationship dynamics. And uh, I've intentionally held off on, on certain, uh, certain things that, that one might expect in a relationship series because, well, because that's what, what you would expect. And usually if you, if you get what you came for, as soon as you show up, as soon as you get where you're going, um, then you might not stay for everything else. So that's why dessert is served last. Um, at least that's what I was told growing up. Although from what I hear, uh, in some cultures, they eat dessert first and then the salad last because the salad helps you digest. That's also something that I just heard. I don't know if there's any validity to that, but it sounds good if you want to have dessert first. We have talked about, we've talked about dysfunction, boundaries, fin friendship, uh, motives in relationship, like how we deal with each other, separation in relationship when it's time to uh, to go separate ways. We've talked about our our personal selves um, and different ways that we that we measure and identify who who we are and how we are. So we've talked about zodiac signs. We've talked about personality traits. And then last week we talked about uh, we talked about getting along. We talked about how to have harmony in our relationships. And uh, this week and for the next I don't know, one or maybe two weeks after this, uh, we're going to talk about romantic relationships. Um, so, so tonight, we're going to talk about romantic relationships. So here's the thing. I just want to set this up properly. Uh, it does not matter what your relationship status is. All of it applies to all of us. There is something for all of us in all of the parts all of the parts of the Bible. So, so tonight, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, but we're not starting at the beginning. If you're familiar with the passage, uh, then you would think like, oh, we're going to start at the beginning. We're going to talk about married people, and it doesn't apply to me, but I'm not. we're not starting at the beginning of, uh, of that part of chapter 7, so you won't pay attention. If you have your Bible, get your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to highlight these verses real quick so that I don't lose my spot. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and go to, uh, go to verse 32. We're going to focus uh, our time in verses 32 through, uh, through 35. And I'm just highlighting so that, so that I don't lose my place because I'll lose my place. And actually, um, just one verse before that, uh, that that I'm going to, that we're going to look at is verse 24 as well, so that we capture our, our first, our first point. And so uh, let's, let's read 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7. I'll read verse 24. And then I will actually, I'm just, I'm going to read the whole thing. We're not going to, we're not going to look at all of it, but I'm going to read the whole thing just so that we have all of the context and then we can, and then we can go on. So I'm going to read first Corinthians chapter seven, starting at verse 24 through verse 35. And then we'll focus on what I said we're going to focus on tonight. I am primarily going to be in the amplified version of the Bible. Um, that's, that's where I'll be in the Amplified, but whatever translation you have is great. First Corinthians 7, starting at verse 24. So, brethren and sistren, in whatever station or state or condition of life each one was, each one was when he or she was called, let there, let them continue with and close to God. Now concerning the, the virgins, the, the, the marriage the marriageable maidens, that's what it says in parentheses in the Amplified, about marriageable maidens, eligible for marriage. So concerning those that, I'll come back to that, concerning those eligible for marriage, I have no command of the Lord, but I give my opinion and advice as one who by the Lord's mercy is rendered trustworthy and faithful. I think then because of the impending distress that is even now setting in, 
it is well, expedient, profitable, and wholesome for a person to remain as he or she is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife or husband? Do not seek a wife or a husband. But if you do marry, you do not sin in doing so. For And, and if a virgin marries, a, a, a marriage-eligible person uh, marries, she does not sin in doing so. Yet those who marry will have physical and earthly troubles, and I would like to spare you that. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has been winding down and it has grown very short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as if they had none. And those who weep and mourn as though they were not weeping and mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they did not possess anything. And those who deal with this world over using the enjoyments of this life, as though they were not absorbed by it, and as if they had no dealings with it. For the outward form of this world, the present world order, is passing away. My desire is to have you free from all anxiety and distressing care. The unmarried man or woman is, is anxious about the things of the Lord, how they may please the Lord. But the married person is anxious about worldly matters, how, how they may please their, their wife or husband. And he is drawn in diverging directions. His interests are divided and he is distracted from his devotion to God. And the unmarried woman or girl is concerned and anxious about the matters of the Lord, how to be wholly separated and set apart in body and spirit. But the married woman has her cares centered in earthly affairs, how she may please her husband. Now I say this for your own welfare and profit, not to put a, a halter of re restraint upon you, but to promote what is seeming, what is seemly and in good order and to secure your undistracted and undivided devotion to the Lord. The word of the Lord is already blessed. Father God, your word is blessed. Now bless us with your word by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I want to add to the verses that I said. In the verses that I said is... Uh, I said, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 24, I want to add 26, 24, 26, and then 32 through 35. Yes, the, uh, this is a different amplified version that, that I was reading. I was... Um, I was doing my best to to make the parts that are non-gender specific non-gendered because it's so easy when things are gendered in scripture that uh like in the original language and intent were not gendered it's easy to be like oh that's not for me if 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 the bible says uh she ought to do x y and z then it's like, as a man, it's like, well, that's for, that's for her, that's for them, as if, as if the principle doesn't apply to me as a man, or, you know, brothers, if a man is not married, then he should stay unmarried, well, that's just for the men, like, I don't know how, well, never mind, I do know how that could work, but that's not what we're, we're not talking about how that could work. Our, our topic for tonight is, uh, is, is remain as you are. It's real simple. Remain as you are. Better yet, because remain as you are is actually my first point. We're going to call tonight's Bible study. We're going to call it stay put. That's what it says. 
and the, and the amplified. I'm going to read verses 24 and 26 again, just just for, for for context, so that we're so that we're all in the same same place. And and our first point, which you can take down now, is remain as you are. Verse 24 says, "So brethren, brethren and sistren, brothers and sisters, in whatever station or state or condition of life each one was when he or she was called, there let them continue with and close to God." And then verse 26 says, I think then because of the impending distress that is even that is even now settling in, it is well, expedient, profitable, and wholesome for a person to remain as he or she is. Remain, remain as you are. Now, this little section that we're talking about, uh, this little section that we're, we're talking about is going to be largely directed towards those who are in this, this status that Paul is talking about right here. When he says remain, when he first says, you know, whatever status you're in, when God calls you, like stay put. Um, and we may go back to it. If you're married, don't go looking to get divorced. Uh, if you are not married, uh, you know, don't go rushing to go and get married. Like, and this is Paul's opinion. And he says it flat out, like, this isn't like a directive from the Lord, but with all the directives from the Lord that I've received from my life experience and from all the teaching I've done and all of my pastoral experience and planting churches and, and, and developing leaders and all of that all throughout uh, parts, parts of the world, as I press my way towards Rome, uh, it's, it, I, I am of the opinion that you should just stay as you are getting saved is not is not a reason for you to go get a divorce from the spouse that you've been wanting to leave no stay put stay as you are if they're willing to stay with you you stay with them um but just because you just because you get saved doesn't mean now you must be you must be married you must get a spouse and it, this is so important because i'm afraid that in the world of western christendom uh Many, many of us have been been taught or, or led to believe that there's something wrong with our Christianity, with our faith, if we are not married by some particular undescribed age, we should be married. And that is what it is to be Christian. Family values, right? So one should get, if you're a good Christian, then you should get married. Now, I'm just going to throw out there that a lot of that is projection. Because Paul talks about like, if you, if you can't, if you don't have any self-control, then go ahead and get married and, you know, do, do that thing that married people do. And so uh, the idea that you must get married when you're a Christian is, is a projection of people who don't have self-control. That is, that is my belief. Uh, so P Paul says, whatever station in life you're in, stay there. But he says, with God and close to God. The whole point is with God and close to God. Relationships, we, 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 yes, we're talking about, at this point, we're talking about romantic relationships or, or, the, or the lack thereof. And, and that, that doesn't mean the exclusion of our spiritual relationship or our relationship with God. In fact, this is all within the context and inside of the world of our relationship with God. Because if you if you are not, if you're not a believer, you're not a follower of Jesus, then this stuff really doesn't apply to you. Like do, do what you do, do what you want to do. This is as it pertains to being in relationship with God. And so whether you, whether you're already married when you get saved or when you come back or you, you like get saved for real or, or you're not, stay as you are with God, close to God. The, that's the operative part is being with God and close to God. So, so when, when it says, when he says remain as you are, that it is well, it is expedient, profitable, wholesome for a person to remain as he or she is, that carries with it the assumption that we are with God and that we are close to God. 
And so before we before we go down a path of changing our relationship status, we we need to make sure that our relationship status with God is 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 that we are with God and that we are close to God. Because changing our outward relationship status is not going to be the thing that makes the difference. And, and there is no part of, uh, of our human relationships, uh, particularly the, the romantic type relationship, there's no part of that that, uh, that has any impact on, uh, on eternity. And I realize that that goes counter to uh to what a lot of us may have been taught but like being married or not being married is not a determining factor in our salvation it's just not but being with god and being close to god is is part of is part of our salvation now we're going to jump down to we're going to jump down to verse 32 this is why paul says this this is the reason why and the reason why and this is this is our, our, our second point we're going to take from this is, is to avoid avoidable anxiety. Avoid avoidable anxiety. Verse 32 says, my desire is to have you free from all anxiety and distressing care. What Paul is saying is that, is that being in a lifetime partnership with with a romantic partner being married comes with anxiety and distressing care now that comes with the relationship that is not me describing my marriage to my wife or or describing my wife that is describing marriage itself and it doesn't matter if a person had checks off everything on your egotistical idolatrous list that is you know requirements for that person to to be become your spouse it doesn't matter if they if they meet all of those markers your relationship is going to come marriage comes with anxieties and distressing cares that do not exist outside of the world of being married now you probably heard me say before and i want to double down on this or triple down, however many downs this is, that there's no such thing as single people. I, I know some of the translations like the ESV says, uses the term single. There's no such thing as single people, there's people. Now for the sake of the conversation about marriage, there's married and unmarried just to distinguish the two. Uh, and, and then there's also a category uh, of those who are, are, are widowed but there are there's no such thing as single people because if so at what point in life does a person become single i i've got a two-year-old an almost four-year-old and i've got an 11-year-old are they single or are they children what happens when the 11-year-old turns 13 is he still single or does he become single or or is or is he just 13 or depending what age you are when you when you hit 21 when you hit 21 is that when you become single if you're not you know if you're not attached to someone is that when you become there is no point in time at which you become single unless you get married and then you are no longer married but then you're still just you're still unmarried so there's no such thing as single people and Paul's desire here that he's expressing is, is like, stay that way. You came into this world not being attached to another person and, and, not, and not taking on the anxieties and distressing cares of being with another person in, in, a, in a covenant relationship for the rest of your life. Like, why, why change that? Why change that if you don't have to? Let's keep let's keep let's keep reading what it says. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the, of the of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly matters, how he may please his wife. I just want to put it out here that uh, 
two quick things, because it goes it goes on to say the same thing about the unmarried woman and the married woman. Uh, the unmarried person is is cares about the things of the Lord, is, is only worried and concerned about the things of the Lord. Because again, remember, this is this is based on the premise, like it says in verse 24, that, we, that you are with God and you are close to God. If you are not with God and close to God, then there's a, then there's a chance that as an unmarried person, then you might not be so concerned about about the work of the Lord. You just might you just might be doing doing what you do. But in here, it, it says that the married person is anxious about worldly matters, how to please their spouse. Pleasing a spouse is a worldly matter. Does it, does it have kingdom implications? Absolutely. The marriage relationship is, is a beautiful imagery of the relationship between, between Christ and his church. And, and, and that gets used in scripture. Paul uses it to describe how, how husbands should love their wives, just like Christ loved the church. So it, it's this beautiful imagery. Um, and, and we get to experience in, in these family relationships, what the relationship between God and his children are between Christ and his church. So marriage is a beautiful thing, but actually in actually being married, like my wife is not God. My wife is not Jesus. I'm not Jesus to my wife and, and she is not the Lord. I used to think when I was a kid, I used to think the Lord was like the feminine version of, of God because it's like there's God and that sounds masculine. Lord was like feminine and wore a veil. That was just what was in my head. So please don't like take this clip and put it out there that I said that Lord is the feminine version of, of God. That's just what I thought when I was a kid. You know, you know, we come up with stuff in our heads, but I don't know. But my wife is not the Lord. My wife is a human, a human being. And so it, it is my responsibility to meet her needs, to, to please my wife as a married person. It is the responsibility of a married person to to attempt to please their spouse. But because their spouse is not Jesus, that's a worldly matter. Now, if you do not have a spouse, you're able to devote your life, your living to the things of the Lord. Not, not earthly matters like, my nah, what what was our anniversary? What, what, is he, what does he want for his birthday? I'm not buying no man, no PlayStation. Uh, you know, why does she, why does it cost this much to take a woman out? Like, we don't have to, you don't have to think about all of that stuff. There are no, there are no $200 dates in, in the world of being unmarried. If you're not married and you're not trying to get married, ain't no $200 dates except the one you take yourself on. And that's just called self-care. So avoid avoidable anxiety. Now, Paul says, if you, if you get married, there's nothing wrong with that. So this is not to discourage anyone from 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 getting married, from getting married or or seeking marriage. This is this is just aimed at, at helping us to avoid avoidable anxiety. Look, once you're in it, you're in it. And anyone who is or has been married can testify that there are anxieties that come with it that do not exist when you get the whole closet to yourself and if you got a, if you got a place where the, the bathroom has two sinks you get both sinks and you can use one sink to wash your face and the other sink to, for brushing your teeth and you can switch it whenever you whenever you feel like it you can you can hang your clothes up how you want to you can leave them on the floor if you if you, you stay by yourself like who gonna check me but there are all these things that that we have to be concerned about in the marriage relationship, and that pulls away from our ability to, to be concerned about the things of God. Verse 34 says, uh, speaking about, about, about the man, he is drawn in diverging directions. His interests are divided, and he is distracted from his devotion to God. As a third point, you can put down that we are to be devoted. We are to be devoted. 
Now, whatever, whatever uh, relationship we're in, whatever our relationship status is, we're to be devoted. We're to, we're to be devoted. If you are not in a relationship with another, a romantic relationship with another human being, and, and those points, again, uh, remain as you are was number one. Number two is avoid avoidable anxiety. And, and number three, we are to be devoted. And so the, the married person has, it, I, the reason I use the Amplified tonight is because I love the words that it uses, drawn in diverging directions. So interests are divided. And he is distracted from his devotion to God. Me, as a married man, in my devotion to my wife, I am distracted from my devotion to God. But it's but it's a it's a godly distraction because of how I'm how I'm called, because I chose to get married, how I am called to live and be as a husband toward my wife. It's a godly distraction to be devoted to my wife, but it's a distraction nonetheless. There are things that I do not do that I do not consider doing or that I consider as like, mm, not gonna be able to do that because of my devotion to my wife and my family. And that's okay, that's good. It should be that way. But if you, are not currently in a marriage relationship and already feel like you don't have enough time to accomplish the things, everything that God has set before you to do. Throwing, an, throwing like a whole person into your schedule seems, seems seems like self-sabotage. Again, this is not to discourage anyone from pursuing marriage. It's just the reality. We're just talking about reality here. We're just talking about reality. We're to be devoted. We're to, we are to be devoted to God. And if we, if we get into this, this covenant relationship, we're to be devoted to our spouse and to God. So get you so get you someone who could do both. Because listen, it's not going it doesn't do my family a bit of good if I stay cooped up, locked up in my office reading books and praying and worshiping and and doing all kind of pastoral stuff and never tend to them. That that there's some missing devotion in my life if that's what's taking place. And likewise, I'm not doing nothing for the kingdom if every waking hour is is spent devoted to wife and kids. I have to be about the business and the assignment that God has given me. I have to be about the business and the assignment that God has given me. I have to be, I'm, I'm still devoted to that. It's just when we're married, we, we get pulled, we get pulled in, in, in two different directions. Let me just finish reading reading this part. Uh, and, it, and I'm in verse 34. And the unmarried woman or girl is concerned and anxious about the matters of the Lord, how to be wholly separated and set apart in body and spirit. I, I just want to I want to point out, I just want to stop right there and point out there, there's not a difference here what it said what it says about the man and this is why we can't get so hung up on if it says man or woman we need to look at the principle that's being taught because where paul says man in in 32 the unmarried man is anxious about the things of the lord how he may please the lord and then it says uh in verse 34 the unmarried woman or girl is concerned and anxious about the matters of the lord how to be wholly separated and set apart in body and spirit and we have taken that, maybe not on purpose, but sometimes I think on purpose, to say, oh, the unmarried woman is supposed to be wholly separated and set apart in body and spirit. But it doesn't say that for the man, so the man can be devoted to the Lord unmarried and do whatever he wants with his body. That's not what it says. 
And when we put stuff in there that that it doesn't say, then we we're that's that's creating an idol. That, that is idol worship. To to insert something that God did not say and and to live it as though it is a mandate. That's that's idolatry. We talked about idolatry before. But I just wanted to point out that it doesn't mean that the man, that men who are not married are not also supposed to be wholly separated and set apart because the word sanctified means wholly separated and set apart. And and, and what we are in the process of in our salvation, when we get saved, we are sanctified. And then we live out the process of being continually sanctified. So sanctification is for all believers, not just women. Verse 35, now I say this for your own welfare and profit, not to put a halter, not to put a halter of restraint upon you, but to promote what is seem, what is seemly and good order and to secure your undistracted and undivided devotion. And this just falls under, under that third part about we are to be devoted. We, and there's two types of devotion. In the, in the context of romantic relationships. And by the way, there can be romance in, in other relationships that are not like partners. But when I say romantic relationship, I mean in the sense that we use the term most, most often. But there's, there's two types of devotion. There is divided and distracted devotion, and there is undistracted, undivided devotion. And, and the choice is really ours. But here, but here is the here is the the charge. I won't say it, it's not a caution, but here is the charge. The reason Paul is saying and suggesting, I think y'all should be like me. He was unmarried at the time he wrote this. I think y'all should be like me, so that you can devote all of your all of your living. Everything that you do, you can do it holy as unto the Lord. He wrote that too in another letter to somebody else. But see, Paul, as many of you already know, Paul, he was, he, he was, he was on that Southwest vibe. He was free to move about the country. He was free to move about the world. He would go on a trip. He would go on a missionary trip. When he went to Ephesus, he was there for like two years. You think he could have done that if he was married? without bringing his family with him, without uprooting his family and being like, okay, we're going to go. And, and we're as, as a Christian family, we're, we're, we're now a Christian family. We're going to move. I'm moving you all to, uh, to Southern Europe. Uh, yes, I'm moving my Middle Eastern family to Southern Europe, and we're going to live there for a couple of years, planting, church planting. We're going to live there for a few years, church planting. Now, I might get thrown in jail or beaten in every city we go to. He couldn't have done that if he was married. Or he would have been, I mean, he could have, but then he'd have just been being a real bad, neglectful husband. So for those of us who are not married, and this, this will be a question, what is, it, what is our life? devoted to what is our life devoted to and if and if we are going to divide our devotion to god then we better then we better take that marriage thing seriously and not just like mm, we'll see how it goes maybe i will maybe i won't and and this isn't in here. Like there, there. I'm gonna say this now. There's nothing that I'm aware of in the Bible, like th that, that speaks directly to like dating. Doesn't mean we can't talk about dating, but it is like there's no rules in the Bible. But like here is how you date. So I'm gonna go out on a limb and and say something else, just because it all starts with D's and I like alliteration consider the possibility that dating is also a distraction but it's a doubly it's a doubly divided distraction see cuz cuz if if 
if you're getting married, then then that is solid. There's, there's one person, this is what I'm devoting. I'm devoted to God and I'm devoted to the assignment that God has given me, but I'm also devoted over here because it, it, is, it is, is a good thing to, to, to find a spouse. A man who finds a wife, finds a good thing and finds favor. There ain't nothing wrong with that. But all this little in-between here and how we all make up our own rules for how to in-between goes, that's just doubly distracted especially if there's no intention involved. It's like, yeah, I'll go out and I'll eat. Uh, Applebee's, two for 20. Nah, that was just, that was just extra, that was just distraction for no reason. Distraction without a cause. No, I'm not saying don't date. I'm just saying it sounds like to me that that's just like extra distraction, but without the commitment. But we'll talk about that another time. Stay put. That was that's the title that we're working with tonight. One, remain as you are. However you are, whatever your relation status is, your relationship status is, remain as you are. Avoid avoidable anxieties. Whether you're already married or you're not married, avoid avoidable anxieties. And and we're to be devoted. And there's two types of devotion. There is there is uh, where is it? There's divided and distracted devotion, and there is undivided, undistracted devotion. And we get to choose. It's really, it's really just a choice. Like there's no right or wrong about it. We just get to choose. 